I recently joined this company, Pyrofax, uh, basically two weeks ago. And what we do is we, we sort of try to create this uh, third generation blockchain technology, oh, smart contracts and all that buzzwords. Um, and we do it in Scala. And we provide a language for smart contracts, which is called the Rolang. And to, for me to understand Rolang, I had to read like arbitrary, something around 10 papers. So I, I thought to myself two weeks ago, since I have to do, read it anyway, what's the better way to motivate myself than just to create a presentation? So I contacted Lambda, these people, I said, I will redo my presentation from the scratch. And that was a stupid idea. Um, but we are hiring. So if you're into Scala and you like uh, functional programming and blockchain is something that just thrills you, then you know that's the email that you should probably send your resume. Anyway, you might be thinking, all right, so you do your stuff in Scala, and, but the presentation is titled Understanding Distributed Calculus in Haskell. So Haskell, uh, I don't know, I think I just, I, maybe I enjoy pain, I don't know. Uh, but that's uh, basically what it is. So it's gonna, we're going to have a presentation about Calculi, but we will see some examples in Haskell. How many of you guys understand Haskell syntax? You see, like, awesome, all of you, so I can just skip the tutorial. So I had a tutorial because I had a tutorial about Haskell. You know how to learn Haskell, right? <laughs> you learn about functions and functions composition, and then you learn everything else. So we will focus only that, that first. Obviously, that's a joke, right? Because like, if you think about Haskell, the Haskell is really easy language. It has like, what, 20 keywords? Everything else is paradigm. But since you guys are here on this conference, I guess the language shouldn't be really uh, too hard for you. I have this very quick tutorial of what Haskell is, but since majority of people raise their hands, and if you, if you weren't lying, and I hope you were lying, I will, just, I will just skip it, because why not? So we have ability to create a function. We have ability to create a function that takes one argument. And also, we have ability to define type class. And if you don't know what a type class is, then I don't know, leave the room. And, um, and also, uh, so we have this data type here. And it was supposed to be a character for a game. And I was supposed to have constructors player and NCP. For whatever reason, I named it user and no OP. I, I don't know. It was midnight. So anyway, so you have a, like, since it's deriving the show, you can call this, this, you can create this user and you can call this function and it works. And magically, nothing really special about Haskell. I'm just skipping those slides because everybody raised their hand. They understand Haskell. So uh, here we have our functional greet that takes a greeting and takes some arbitrary A, which has an instance of show, and will just greet that, whatever that is. So for example, we can greet ourselves, say like, greet with, yo, what's up, Pavo, and we'll get back, yo, what's up, Pavo. So all that works pretty well until the, we reach a point where we actually have to you know, reason about the, the, the outside world, which has effects and all that. For that, we have infamous IO type. IO type is just giving us a value at this point in this hello world example, it will give us a unit. But not only gives us a unit, also can do some effectful things. However, IO, if you get an instance of IO, it's not really doing that thing, whatever that thing will be, contacting your database, calling your mom, or I don't know, launching nuclear power weapons. It just gives you a recipe to do it. This gives you a, a, a way to launch those nuclear s missile strikes, but it doesn't necessarily do it at that point. It will do it at some point, but not when you call this function. And you will have a main method that will eventually run your function. So here we have an example of it. We have put string. It's just a function that returns this. It will give us an IO of unit. And what, once we eventually, at some point, evaluate that recipe, what it will do, it will give us a unit back, but it will also internally somewhere out there into the console, print that little string. Another example would be getLine, which is one more timer recipe that gives us a string back, but also has the effect of reading stuff from the console. Now the question would be how we could combine those things together. And obviously, there's this little bind operator here. So I have my first um, IO of unit. And then that gives me a value, which I immediately ignore. And I get a line from it. Now this looks a little bit weird from starting point. Wait till you see a little more complex example, like I want to read an input, get an input back, read another input, and then do something with it. And it already looks bizarre. But if you do a little, little trick, and that is formatting your code, and you, you format it a little bit that, like that, you slightly see that even though we're building this calculation, even though we're creating a function, we sort of see those imperative steps that we first print something to the console, then we read line and get the value here on the right-hand side after the arrow, and then we print something else, ignore the value, and we get a line, 
and add values over here, and then we do something with it. And they recognize that pattern, and that's the do notation, because the notation is exactly the same thing. That's, that's, that's the main difference. So, having that tutorial, everybody are cool? Everybody understand Haskell right now? Awesome, yeah, all right. So distributed process. So distributed process is a very cool framework which I learned a few weeks ago, and it allows you to do one crazy thing. Write Erlang programs in Haskell. Now, you may be thinking, this is stupid, but the cool thing is all the Erlang people are now in the other room, right? So there will be no stupid questions whatsoever. So, so if you are guys from Scala, think Akka. If you are guys from Erlang, think Erlang. It's basically based on this paper from Microsoft, but it was, there were little changes, and they pretty much were influenced by, by Erlang people. Um, so the, the main idea in the distributed process is this concept of a process. So the way you program in distributed process is you have, you have processes, you have ability to send messages between those processes, and then you, then you create your, your distributed system. So a process, as in just think of a process of as, as I.O. It's another uh, effectful type uh, that will build up the recipe for your process and eventually at some point in time uh, it will uh, run your thing. Each process is identified by process ID. So for example, if we have a send method, you will see that it will take the process ID to which you want to send some message. It will take that message as long as that message is serializable and give you as a result a recipe to do it closed over this process. So that recipe returns a unit here. There's also equivalent method called expect, which will give us waits for the value on that message queue somewhere out there and, and, and waits you know, for the value and, and give you once it eventually is uh, brought to you from some other process. Obviously, there are other methods in the API. However, this is not the distributed process tutorial. This is sort of like an example. And if you, if you find it fascinating, you can actually, um, you can actually Google it and, and, and re read the tutorial. So whatever, uh, if you were interested in uh, Philip's Walder uh, uh, talk yesterday when he was uh, talking about ability to work for a company where he works, this is one of the tools that they're actually using there. So worth, the, uh, worth uh, sort of discovering. Uh, so let's have a simple example. Let's say we have a process called master. Master will spawn two sub-processes called ping and pong. And master will send to ping two things. It will initialize the calculation saying, this is, this, this is, this is my ID, master ID. Also, I have a notion of pong uh, process ID. So there you go. And now ping having that will send a message to pong saying, hey, ping. And the pong will be like, yo, pong. And the pong will die, and ping will say, I'm done, and he will die, and master will die. Okay? So this is pretty much straightforward. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit of code with Haskell using distributed process. So there are a bunch of inputs that you need. This is like treated as a boilerplate, but so I will just pretty much ignore it. Uh, so this is, this is what we need. We need our protocol. So we have that, uh, that initial thing, that ping, ping process, ping, pong, and done. Uh, and they need to derive some instances, but those are details of the implementations, which I don't want to cover because that would take another hour. Um, all right, so we have our master. So right now, master, we create a function that will return a process of unit. As I said, this is exactly the same as I.O., so it builds up a recipe for your process. And eventually, somebody will run that recipe somewhere out there once you actually run it. So what do we do? We, we take our uh, master takes its own ID by using a method get self, uh, get self bid that gives him his uh, process ID. Then he spawns to sub-processes, ping and pong. He sends to ping a, a, a message in it where he provides both his own ID and pong's ID, and then, exp and then waits here for message done. After he is done, he returns and, and, and executes. So ping process is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So now he expects the init message, uh, init message expect will block the calculation, right? It waits for the queue to, or for the message to arrive. Once we have it, then it takes its own ID, sends ping to, to Pong with its own ID, and expects Pong, Pong message back. And if it, if it gets it, it sends to the master, I'm done. So the last thing, obviously, will be ping, where ping uh, expects a message ping and sends Pong back to the caller. Does that make sense, more or less? It's a pretty straightforward program, right? So, you know, if we uh, you obviously need to have a, a notion of how to run it. Uh, it, it's pretty cool how they did it because they have a separate layer for transportation. So like the layer that you will send messages through. So you can have to, you can have that implemented over TCP. But if you, for example, want to play around with failures, failing nodes, different kind of weird stuff going around in your network, you can pretty much change that transport layer and, and, and play with, to see how your system reacts with failures. 
So that's pretty cool. But that's, that's again, a, 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 a boilerplate, not for this talk. If you're interested, tutorials are awesome. There's actually a very cool book, which I think I will show at the end of the slides in the reference section, uh, which describes how the whole thing works. We will also like to have ability maybe to log something to our program to actually see what's going on. So there's a little function here, log it, which takes a string and return your process of unit back, but underneath on the console level, it will just you know, log those little messages. So, so for example, ping, we can log things like that. We are waiting for input and we're sending ping and we're waiting for pong and stuff like that. We can do the same thing for pong, that we are waiting for ping message and we're sending pong back. And we can do the same thing to master. Once we have that, we can build our program and I'm using stack and half of you will be like, yeah, the other half will be like, Ooh, or whatever. Now we run it and yay, the program works. All right, so this is pretty awesome. Now I've been creating a little bit more complicated program than this using distributed process. And I, when I started, I was thinking like, yeah, Haskell, this will be like compile and works, but it didn't. And if you think about it, there are like basically there are two reasons behind it. So first of all, we were using, and I, so we are in the Haskell language, which is supposed to be typesf and all that, you know, cool things and features from the language, but we never actually used it. Like those method, mess, uh, yeah, so we really like, you know, we're like a boss, we can run a program, but it's a trap, it doesn't really work. And the reason for it is that, for example, the expect method, uh, whatever it is over here, for example, waits at this point, it pattern match, it will pattern match and done. So it will, it will wait only for that one single message. Nothing is stopping you to send to that process a message which he doesn't understand. The message will, that will not adhere to the protocol. So at, at this point, you're sort of pretty much screwed because your queue may grow and it might explode out of memory issues and all that craziness. It's like we, we lose a little bit of nice features from Erlang, which I'm not gonna talk about, but we lose a lot, a lot of features from Erlang. At the same time, we don't gain anything back. That's pretty stupid, right? Fortunately, there's another API, which I will show later on the, in those slides, that that API takes advantage of having types in your language. So there are, there's a thing called type channels, which allow you to send messages only of a given type and receive only messages only of that given type. Um, I was implementing at the time, um, so I tried to implement the Lampert's uh, logical clocks paper, which I eventually did. But at the beginning, I, after I had the whole implementation, everything compiled, it didn't work. And it only, there were two places where it didn't work. One, because I didn't necessarily understood the, the paper uh, straightforwardly. There was like one little mistake on my side. But the other one was I was not adhering to the protocol. I was expecting messages of a different type and, 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 and like they, they did, did arrive, but were never really, they were never really covered in, in the code. So I thought to myself, okay, so I would probably should use that, that other API that used type channels. But also I tried to reason like, is there other way to formalize my uh, my thinking about distributed system. Uh, there's a very cool book about distributed system by, um, what's the name of the author? I think Nancy Lynch. Uh, she she like covers everything about distributed system. And the book is this huge, right? But so basically everything, and one of the reviews I, I've read uh, behind the book that the guy was saying like, this book is pretty awesome because all those papers are available and you can read them, but every single author will use a different notation with different symbols and just putting in one into your brain is just impossible. And then what she did, she sort of like un tried to at least unify the example so, so that you read the book from, from, the beginning to, from the beginning to the end and, and you sort of get an idea what, what's going on. But the cool, cool, cool question to ask would be, is there, a, is there a way, is there a calculus that would allow us to reason about, about, about computers? Obviously, if you think calculus, you, you might think lambda calculus, right? How many of you guys know lambda calculus? All right, majority of you, awesome. So, but really, really quickly for people who didn't raise their hand, or there were probably some people I will just raise my hand because I was so stupid. So, so this is pretty much all it is to learn the calculus. There's nothing else, there's a variable. So when you define a syntax, you have a variable, you have a, 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 a way to define a function. So that's, that, that next line is just a function that will take x and will do something with an m. And you have the last thing that you can do is you can ha apply an argument to a function. So you will have something of M and you will apply, apply the argument N to it. Uh, so like a few definitions here, the X is something that we call bound variable. And what we mean by that is that there's this equivalence between those two lambdas that you see over here. It's called alpha equivalence. It means that they are pretty much the same thing. The only the way, place they differ is on, is on the axis and on the y's, so the things which are bound. So it thinks of a function, if it's a name, the name doesn't really 
it doesn't really matter what, what name you choose, it's still the same function, right? And, and this, is, this is what they show here. Um, and so this alpha conversion, this is like a little bit more formalized. So lambda x m is exactly the same thing as lambda y m, the only, with only little twitch that you, for every occurrence of x with an m, you substitute it with y. And they are pretty much the same thing. Now, in this, this kind of definition, you will see right now that x is bound, but you also see this little y variable, and you might be thinking, well, the hell that is? And that is something which we call free variable. So it's not bound, it's, it's freely available for anybody to use. And the most important thing in lambda calculus is beta reduction. So beta, beta reduction is nothing else as applying functions to, apply arguments to your functions. It's just consider it as a computation step. So you have your huge lambda, and now you want to run it. The way you run it, is you apply beta reductions. So beta reduction is pretty simple. If I have a function which looks like this, so it's a lambda x with an n, and I apply it to n, then I can reduce that to just n, so I drop my x, and every occurrence of x, I will substitute with n. So example, so if I have something like that, I can take my z and substitute that with n, um, uh, for x, so I'm only left with that little thing here, and I will do exactly the same thing for W, and which gives me at the end Z back, and I cannot reduce any further, and that's it. So you might be thinking, is that it? Is that the whole lambda calculus? Like, it's supposed to be, you know, if you, if you, if you see any of the Phillips Waller talks uh, in the past on YouTube, you will be like, this is bullcrap, but it's supposed to be, uh, give me ability to reason about any computation, right? Turing complete and all that, right? It's just too simple. Well, every single thing that you can think of, uh, number, booleans values, uh, multiple arguments uh, functions, it's all that have its own encodings, which are defined just based on those little things here. So don't worry about it. So little encodings, like for example, there's no such thing in lambda calculus as multiple arguments function, right? Something like that doesn't exist. It's not in the formalism, but you can pretty much build something like that by saying a, a function that takes two arguments is a function that takes one argument and returns a function that takes a second argument and gives you that final body m, right? You probably know it by name, by a famous mathematician. What? There's one person who's saying it's actually correct. That's the guy. Because carry. This guy did a run single paper which Carrie read and he felt like, oh, this is awesome. And then he popularized the idea. But, you know, if you think about it, would you like to call whatever you're doing with your function Schoenfinkeling or Carrie? Schoenfinkeling, sorry, I don't know German. So I guess we're good with, with Carrie. Um, the same thing you could do with Boolean values. So you can, you can have encodings for true and false. And then we will not cover this because if I were to do that, we would need yet another hour, which we're not going to do. But I was like, um, what my professors used to say is this is an exercise for the reader. So this is exercise for you. But you can pretty much see that if you have encoding for true and false, things like, for example, n function or if will, will work. You just apply beta reduction to those things. And you will see that if you call, let's say, if with true, it will give you n back. And if it with false, if you give you n, and 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 function will apply like zero and zero. So false and false is false, and true and true is true. And false and true is also false. And there's a, yet another thing that you could read about, like charge numbers, so how you can encode numbers, natural numbers in lambda calculus. All those little features you can do, and they are available in the language. And the formalism is sort of complete. Now, we might think, all right, so is there a way to have such a formalism, but for distributed system? Because lambda calculus was created for sequential programs. But ever since we have multiple computers running on a network, we have multi-processor architectures, lambda calculus is not enough. And apparently there are. The only problem is that, that with lambda calculus, it's pretty straightforward because you can reason about your calculus very easily. You have your input, uh, you have your output, and sort of in this constructive manner, you can reason like those two lambdas will be, those two programs are equivalent because for any given input, they give exactly the same output. With, with, with process calculus, it's a little bit different because right now, you're, you're, what does it mean that two, pro, two distributed systems are behaving the same way? Like, 
if I have two systems that sort of act the same, but one reacts to failure and the other doesn't, is that the same system? What if one is using shared memory because one is working on a, on, 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 on a multiprocessor machine and the other one is working somewhere on the network and is passing messages over the, over the network? So there are all those little differences that we have to reason about and the, they spawn a number of calculus which try to cover different areas. And with the, this talk is focusing on on calculus that uh, sort of deal with message passing. So the concepts of, of a process running on somewhere on the system and messages being exchanged with each other. So there are two papers which sort of spawned the discussion. They were, they were all created similarly in the same time. One is by Robin Milner, uh, the uh, calculus of computing, uh, communicating system. And the, body, and the second one is uh, uh, Tony Hoare, communicating sequential processes. And they were pretty much the same. They, they, they sort of uh, created this notion of a process uh, ability to send messages between process, but they were a little bit too immature. They were lacking some features which essentially the, the, the people proved that they are not enough. They are not strong enough to, to sort of formalize calculations that you can run on, on, on distributed so, uh, system. So a few years later, Robin Milner creates this calculus called Pi Calculus, and that Pi Calculus, a synchronous uh, uh, calculus for distributed system, as, uh, as, a, as a foundation for the beginning of, beginning of our talk. So, uh, PyCalculus calculus is, gives you ability to reason about compu computation in a distributed system. It gives you a concept of a process, it gives you a concept of a, of a message that you can send over a channel. Nice, one, one nice feature about this, and that's the difference between the previous work of, of Robin Milner, is that right now channels can be also messages, so you can have two processes. That process can have, like, grasp this channel here and send that channel to the other process so that the other process could start reading messages from that channel as well. So that was, that was one little feature that they added to this calculus. So, so it gives you a process, it gives you a channel, it gives you all the ability to reason about replication, about sending channels over to each other, also reason about non-determinism, which is actually pretty cool, and we will show that in a minute. So that's the whole syntax. It looks scary, but it really isn't. So, you can have a, a nothing process. Zero is just doing, not doing anything. It's just, it's just there. It starts and, and, and ends and, and, and it's gone. Uh, you can have an input, uh, input prefix. So this is the, what, what we are saying here is our process right now will wait on channel X for message Y. And once it receives that message, it will behave like P. So it will, like P is a continuation. It will start calculating whatever is in P. And that's synchronous, it waits for that message. The other one is output prefix. So it sort of sends a message Y over channel X. The important notion here is that synchronous, so it waits for a receiver to grab the message before it continues with P. We have an, oh, sorry, we, um, oh yeah, so there's an example here I can actually show you. So we have a, we have a program process P that sends a message hello on channel X and then receives the message hello on channel X. And let's try to model it. So it looks like this. So I send message hello on X and then I receive some message on X and I, and I finish my execution. So I have my process, I send that message and the notion that we see here, we would like to see like this message was being sent over that channel and it just goes back to the process and then it's done and the process uh, finishes execution. However, that's not the thing because as I said, both of those uh, calls, both sending a message and receiving message are synchronous. While waiting for a message for it to be blocking uh, computation makes sort of sense, but the fact that sending a message is also blocking is counterintuitive if you ever work in a distributed environment. But PyCalculus, the original PyCalculus, Pi calculus, is synchronous and you have to be aware of it that this program will block at this point. It will try to send a message hello, but there's no other process that will listen on channel X before, because the continuation here only happens after this thing is received. So that, that guy will not receive that message and this thing will not work. Now, we have also an ability to run two, so we can create a process which will have two sub-processes running in parallel. So here we have a construct that will give us a process P and Q sub-processes which will run in parallel. We have also a thing called restriction. So restriction gives us, if you see uh, something like that, it will give you a new channel X by name, channel X, that will be unique to the rest of the, of the continuation. So it will be unique for the P. Now this is a new letter Greek, like you know lambda, you know pi, do you know how to pronounce this? 
letter? It's Ni. If you have uh, problems to remember it, think of Monty Python and Holy Grail. Ni, ni. So this is basically it. Um, and the last bit, uh, oh yeah, and you can, uh, you can see how that restriction works. So, so we have here a, a process where we have two free variables, y and x. Both of them are fr uh, free in this, in this, uh, in this uh, syntax. But once I create a new, uh, I will say, ni x, it creates a new channel for p. And at this point, it bounds that x to p. X will be here, will be no longer free because it will be bound to that value. So those two processes, those two um, um, equations here are equivalent. The same way they were equivalent in lambda calculus. The last thing, so having all that, before we move into the replication, we can now finally create our program that will actually do something. So here we have a, a process P that sends a message, the other one receives a message, and then the, 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 the final one just pulls them all to run in parallel. And most of the time, if, if the process ends with zero, we just omit it. It's just like, it doesn't really matter, it shouldn't be there. Um, so, you know, like we can try to execute it. We create a process R, which, like, which spawns two subprocesses in, in, which run in parallel. The, they have a, a unique channel created for them. And now we send a message hello over that channel, and there's the other process that will receive it. Once that is done, P finishes its execution. And so queues, and, and since oh, two of them executed and they are done, then the R is done as well. All right, it works. Now, the last one, replication. Uh, we will see maybe replication in a minute, but think of it that if you have uh, exclamation mark P, uh, think of it that there are like infinite copies of P running in parallel. It sounds bizarre, but it will make half sense, sense in, a, in a minute. Let me show you an example. Now, there's one important concept of stru structural conjurance. And what it means is that you can have two processes which behave the same, even though they have a different structure. So you can swap one, after, um, one to the other and the other way around, even though they look differently in terms of structure, they behave the same way. And there are like, there are, maybe I will just put it out there, the way to reason about it. So for example, if I have P and Q running in parallel, it's exactly the same as Q and P running in parallel. Or if I have, you know, um, two of them running as a subprocesses in parallel to R. This is exactly as if those two were subprocesses of some process which would run in parallel to, to P. Scope extrusion is in interesting because it's saying that if I have some process which has unique, unique channel X and it runs in parallel with Q, that uniqueness is, can be also thought of as uniqueness for, the, for those two running in, in parallel. And now you can see how replication works. If you see uh, exclamation mark P, it's pretty much the same as just P running in parallel with yet another exclamation mark. So it can, you know, recursively till the end of the word uh, replicate itself. Uh, can, you, can you say a little bit more about scope exclusion? Because that would be Oh, it's, it's just how it is. And we, like, so the question is, can I say a little bit more about scope exclusion? Because that's not, not intuitive. It's, it's just how it's defined within the formalism. So if you, if you create implementation, just have to adhere, adhere to that, that, that way of, we, you can think that if you, have, if you have a channel which will be uh, unique to the process that runs in sort of, that, that process is running as a sub process somewhere in the bigger process, and the other process are running in parallel with that little thing, they will have ability to communicate so we can extract it, that, that uniqueness outside of the, of the bigger circle, right? That's, that's the general idea. So now we also have right now, because like, the same thing as in if, uh, with lambda calculus, lambda calculus doesn't actually, didn't have any meaning until we have the ability to run it. So we had beta reduction in lambda calculus. Here we have reduction rules as well. So one more time, we think about them as computation steps. So those are, um, I think there are three or four. So one of them would be a, something which we call communication. And it's also pretty straightforward. straightforward. If we have two sub-processes which run in parallel, and one tries to send a message, and the other one tries to receive the message, and we can think of it as just we get P and Q running in parallel, only we have to substitute any occurrence of Z with Y. Because we say, uh, we send Y over X, and it's being received as Z on the other side. So this is one reduction rule. The other one is saying, if P already is being uh, reduced to Q, then it will happen even if P runs in parallel. So running in parallel doesn't change the fact that it can reduce to, to some Q. Um, 
And here we're saying like if P is reducing to Q, it will reduce to Q even if there's like new channel up in front of it. And the same thing applies. Oh, so the last thing sort of takes advantage of the structure conjurance saying if, if P is, is the same as P, P prime in terms of structural conjurance and Q prime is the same as Q in those terms and those two can reduce, so P prime can reduce to Q prime, then we can say that P can reduce to Q. More or less it means that if I have two processes and they look differently but they behave the same and, and they already, those different ones are reduced one to another, then the original ones will reduce as well. So here we have simple example, ping and pong, right? We send a message and we send a message back and, and we can see how that works. So, so uh, well, what, what, what kind of rule we can use here? The first rule would be communication, right? This is the, the rule and it's saying that if I, somebody is sending a message over that channel and somebody else in parallel is trying to receive that message, we will just remove it and substitute names. But here I'm using the same names, so there's no substitution. But you, but you can see that the same thing will happen one more time, right? Because one more time somebody is sending a message and somebody else is receiving it, so we can, might as well just remove it. And now we have two zeros running in parallel. Now, can we, can we reduce that even further? Like, what's your intuition? What's the final state? Zero. It should be zero, right? But I couldn't find a single paper that would reduce it. To, like, would, that would say something like, if P and zero, then P. I found it on Wikipedia. So I make my claim that it works, okay? Uh, so yesterday, somebody told me that in the original, uh, original uh, CCS paper, Robert Nunner has this rule in that paper and that's probably like maybe he forgot it or something but that was in the original paper and also we will see other calculus in a minute um, that that rule is is explicitly there but our intuition like my, my like ask, I asked my boss about it and and he said like without this rule all hell would broke loose so like we have to like it, it's it's there like we assume I call it Wikipedia equivalence and like <laughs> <laughs> and let's move on with it all right so it's zero. Uh, the other one is just, it's a very, sim a very uh, pretty similar to what we've seen before, but this little important notion that you will see that I'm at this point, what I'm doing is, and I'm on channel X, I'm sending a channel. So Y is another channel that I send, and then um, somebody else will receive that channel as a message and then use it as a channel, so he will start listening for messages. So we, we like, we, uh, one more time communication rules, that channel is being sent and now this channel after being sent is being used as a form of communication. This is, this is, this is what was unique in Pi calculus and, and give it more power and it was like sort of like closing the theory to be the whole calculus. And, and the, within the paper, if you actually read the paper, they show that you can go from Pi calculus to lambda calculus. So, so you have the whole completeness of, of, of uh, uh, describing any arbitrary algorithm. Uh, so, and that reduced to zero. Um, um, that, yeah, so now we, we could have an example of ping pong one more time, but we, right now we have a ping and two pongs running. So we can, if, if we apply those rules, the, the communication rules, so we will see that actually two different things might happen. I can either, I can either reduce those two guys or reduce those two guys. And depending on which path I will choose, we will get, the, the other reduction will be cancelled, will be completely removed. So if I choose one of them, and essentially what I get is this. I get a process which never terminates, right? And it's, a, it's a, like, it's, it sort of might be an important feature uh, to, to notice. The other one would be, what if I have a ping pong and they run in parallel? So, uh, so I could see that they will never finish the calculation because they will always, always duplicate themselves with that, with that replication rule over here. So we, we exchange ping with just ping and one more time ping with exclamation mark. And we already know those ping and pong will reduce themselves to zero. But one more time we, get, we are back to square one so we can just replicate it one more time and it will run till the end of the world. So this is not a bad thing because we have obviously programs that run till the end of the world, like servers receiving messages and all that stuff. But you can 
uh, with that calculus, reason about those, mess, uh, those, um, those systems. And the last example is also from the paper, and it shows you that it also have, gives you the ability to reason race conditions. So I have, a, I have a situation here, and I have two messages that try to send some message over X, and there is one guy who tries to receive it. And now depending on who will win the race, I will either get this or that. So I have a calculus that allows me to reason about race conditions within my system, which is also, I think, pretty, pretty, pretty neat. Um, and yeah, this slide should be removed. But there's, there's a notion of bi-simulation, bi but all right, so really quickly, just because I want to read some cool things, uh, there is a notion, okay, so at, at some point, obviously, like, when I created this talk, I reasoned about the slides, it told me that it's going to be three hours. So I was like, oh, we have to cut some stuff. But, uh, I, but obviously, it wasn't good enough. But in, in, in the distributed process, we have a notion of a channel. So we have a notion of a send port and receive port, and the tuple of those two gives us a channel back. So it gives the ability to send over channel some messages of type A and receive messages of type uh, A as well. And so you, here you have a method send channel. So you give them a send port, you give them a message A, and, and gives you a process back that send that message over that channel. At the same time, if you have receive port, you can say I'm on that receive port, I'm waiting for a message of type A, which is brilliant. That's just exactly what we found in PyCalculus. So yeah, we, we, could, we could make this stuff work, right? So, so this is our little ping pong written in that, in that uh, PyCalculus. And now we try to, to create something that would look exactly like that in a distributed system. So we have a master which will create a channel X. And we will spawn two processes, ping and pong, and we will give them that channel so they, so they have the ability to listen on that channel. And then we'll just, we will wait on that channel X for a message done, okay? So what ping can do? Well, ping will do very straightforward thing. It will, it will send a message ping over that channel X, and then we'll wait for a pong. We will try to receive message X on, uh, sorry, message a pong on that channel X. And at, at once that is done, it will send message done which master will receive. And Pong was supposed to just wait for message ping and send Pong back. This is easier to, to reason about, and it's that we have that type safety we, we wanted really, really, really to have. The only problem is this will not work. And the reason why this will not work is that we are giving, we're sending the other process a, 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 a channel uh, a re receive port, which is not allowed. You can send a send channel, so you can give some other process, here's your channel, here's my channel, there you go. You can use that channel as long as you're going to send messages over this channel. But you are not allowed to receive messages on that channel. And why is that? The, the same thing, you, like if, if our people here from Scala community, the same thing is not implemented in Nakka typed. And exactly for the same reason. Ronald Kuhn had a, had a presentation about pi calculus and how he tried to apply pi calculus for ACA type. And exactly the same thing. He said, if I were to allow receiving messages on a channel that was sent to some other process, that would make me to implement Paxos or whatever distributed consensus uh, protocol over it, which would be just bizarre too complex and wouldn't really work in, in, in production. And the same, the same things those guys are telling for distributed uh, uh, process uh, library in Haskell. It's still, I know, five minutes, so don't worry about it. Um, um, they're saying it's, it's doable, but it will complicate the system and it will just not work. So, so we are screwed. Like if we want to reason, still reason about our, um, our distributed system, a synchronous pi calculus is not enough because by its nature it's synchronous and, we, and distributed systems are not. Um, we have this implementation issue of receiving messages on the channels and it, the, the theory itself, it's not closed because we have a notion of a process, process, we have a notion of a channel, but names are arbitrary things. Name can be anything. It's like, it's a detail left for the implementator. Like, there, 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 it would be really nice if we had also a theory which would be closed over the notion of names. Like, we would know how to define names and what the names are. So we would have a formalism, so if somebody would just implement that, that formalism directly, everything would work out of the box. There would be no additional cognitive work that the implementator had to do. So given that I have five minutes, I will not cover what I wanted to cover. Um, I will just give you a notion of what, what are 
further research and what, what further in time was being made. So there is a notion of asynchronous calculus. And, and like in that calculus, the, the guy, so the problem is we want to have an ability, we still have ability to wait when we, we, when we try to receive a message, we can block, that's fine. But if we send a message, that should be asynchronous. I just, I'm just going to give you a message back and I can continue with my calculation. So the guy behind the paper, he, he created this, like he used this uh, um, chemical abstract machine thing for some other paper. And I think it just makes things, things a little bit more complex and it's just really hard to reason about. Like, I tried to read that paper, it was obvious, but it was weird. Uh, like, like, like molecules and like they, they, they heat and they connect and they cool down and like, uh, all this craziness. The idea, the basic, like, it's, it's fun paper to read, but the main idea here is that while, while in a synchronous calculus, you, you sort of were, before continuing with P, you had to wait on that little thing to receive that message. Asynchronous pi calculus just disallows it. So that it pretty much looks like, it's not really how it is defined in the paper, just so, you, like, just so we clear on that. But the idea is pretty simple. Like if I'm sending a message, it, it's, a, it's a thing that does it, and that's it. So if the process is doing any, anything else, it will do this thing in, in either in parallel or this will be some sequential step, but this will be the last step because it only sends message and it executes the, cal the calculation. And, um, and as I said, it allows you to have this ability to um, expressively uh, sort of reason about your distributed system. Uh, one notion, there's a paper that they, they sort of, um, they sort of uh, prove that there is no way for you to describe everything from synchronous pi calculus in asynchronous calculus, so you have to be aware of that. Um, but uh, as I said, those, those heating rules and cooling rules is all really, really complex. There is another paper which we'll not cover right now, obviously. The slides will be online, but I, I just want to give you like a few, few hints here. That paper is called raw, raw calculus. Raw is from reflecting higher order calculus, and that reflective part is actually pretty neat. Because if you know LISP, you know LISP have, has M expression and S expressions, right? You have ability to take your code and, that's, and sort of like lift that code as a structure, right? So LISP itself will not have higher order functions, but you can still take any arbitrary function, lift it to a structure, send it over to some other function, and then sort of drop it. Like those dual different languages. And they apply the same, so and that, that notion of quoting uh, a, a, a calculation and, and dropping it is, is called sometimes reflection. And they brought that notion to the, to the calculus of distributed system. And at a pretty, so the, I will not, as I said, uh, obviously like we are finishing this, finishing this presentation, but I just want to say it's a really cool paper to read. It's probably the first paper, paper that I read that had emojis in it, like wings and like stuff like that. So it's really cool, funny, and it's like, but it's, it's, it's actually, uh, it's, in, it's written by uh, Greg Meredith, uh, the, the, the guy who is behind our chain, and he's a really cool person, and you can see it from the paper that that guy is pretty cool. Uh, and I will skip all that craziness here because we don't have time for it. But important thing is that the language that we ah oh, no I know craziness <laughs> a lot. There was more slides I dare you like that really. So the language that we use in our chain to describe smart contacts it is called on um, Rolang, and Rolang is based on on raw calculus. It has all those notions that that craziness is a little bit hidden, so don't worry about it. But this reason about writing smart contracts in, in this calculus is really, really awesome. And one of the things that they actually dealt with is they dealt with uh, ability to receive, a, so, so get a channel from some other process and receive messages on that channel. And the way they use it is they use something called tuple space. Now what tuple space is, I don't know yet. Hopefully I will at some point. Um, so yeah, so if you're interested, like if it was a little bit interesting and would you like to do this, this little crazy stuff in Scala and using functional programming, you know where to find me. We didn't cover a lot of stuff, but sorry, those are the reference. All those papers are actually readable. It's not really that hard to read them. I would just um, encourage you to read from bottom up, PyCalculus, Asynchronous Calculus, and raw calculus, not the other way around because otherwise it'll be just crazy. Uh, that's it for my site. We are hiring. Thank you very much.